what good is a sermon if it has no impact on your daily life and in your walk with Christ? That's why I chose to preach this three-part series about getting smart with our money. Because money is important to people. And how you manage your money and how I manage my money has an impact on our faith and our relationship with God. Merely because we often get the objects of worship confused in our lives. Sometimes we fail to worship the creator and get wrapped up in worshiping the creation, our stuff and our money. And so I determined some time ago to, uh, to offer this three-part sermon series. This is the second installment today. And it deals with a sensitive subject, the subject of debt. Now, I suppose there are some people in this room that have absolutely no debt. Maybe because you're too young and you haven't started out yet to accumulate any. Or maybe because you've just found the way to navigate life without having to ever borrow money. But for most of us, it's an issue and it's something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day way. And so, last week, I talked about delaying gratification as one of the principles that the Amish live by uh, that helps them manage their money. And uh, we're learning from the Amish in this sermon series, and today I want to talk about a second issue that the Amish can help us with in terms of their lifestyle and the way they understand their relationship with God and their relationship to money. And it involves this issue of debt. And quite frankly, the Amish hate debt. They don't want any debt. They basically run from it. And if you had a chance already to look at the uh, insert in your bulletin, there's some sermon notes on there. I'm going to go right through this sheet. If you want to pull it out, feel free to do so. And if you don't have an issue with debt and uh, this is going to be boring for you, well then just uh, take a little nap. But when you get home, pull this out and give it to someone maybe that you know who does have an issue with debt and maybe in some way it can be of help to them. What I'm going to be talking about this morning is debt that is excessive, debt so as to embarrass you before God and others. I think it's basically a given for most of us that debt is the way we manage life. There aren't many of us that have hundreds of thousands of dollars on hand that we can use to just simply go out and pay cash for a house. Most people can't do that and maybe the same in terms of buying a car. What I'm talking about is debt that can hurt you and hurt your relationships in life. Well, the Amish think debt is just a bad thing altogether, and they have an interesting way uh, or an image of, of describing what debt means or what it looks like. They quote uh, P.T. Barnum, you know, the circus guy, from his biography. He once said that debt is like buying a dead horse. What does that mean? Well, think about it. Think about it in terms of your charge card, things that you put on your charge card. You might go out to dinner and put it on your charge card. Uh, you might go and get uh, tickets for a concert or a Phillies game. You might get gas for your car and put it on your credit card. And by the time the bill comes the next month, that stuff's all gone. It's used up. It's gone, but now you're paying for it. The Amish say that's like buying a dead horse. Yeah, you've got a horse, but what good is it? Its usefulness is gone. So they, they avoid debt at all costs. In our culture, on the other hand, debt is a way of life. And I went online and looked up these statistics as far as what we borrow, what we owe as Americans, the average, and it's kind of staggering when you think about it. On average, the average household credit card debt is 15,000, a little over 15,000. Average student loan, a little over $33,000. And average mortgage debt is 153,000. Now, keep in mind, there are some people out there that have huge debt, huge credit card debt, like over $100,000. And that tends to pull the national average up a little bit. But you get the idea. Most people have a significant amount of debt. 
There's no place in the Bible that I could find where it actually says that debt is a sin, that you should not do it because, you should not borrow because it's against God's will. But when debt is mentioned in the Bible, it's most often mentioned in a negative light. And I've given you two scriptures there. Proverbs 22.7 says, the borrower is servant to the lender. So in that sense, the scripture is saying, if you borrow from somebody, you put yourself in an awkward position, whereas you're sort of like the servant and the person you borrowed from is the master. And that's not always a good position to be in. And then Romans 13, 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding. The Amish avoid debt for a handful of reasons, and I've listed them there for you. And, and you know, a lot of what the Amish think is, it just makes sense. Not only is it biblical, but it makes sense. The first reason for avoiding debt, it doesn't make sense to make someone else rich because you and I can't wait to get what we want. And that's basically what happens when you buy something on credit and you're paying interest. Uh, the credit card company, the bank, they're getting rich because you and I can't wait to get what we want. And the Amish say, well, that's foolish. And so they choose to wait to buy whatever it is that they want until they have enough money. Secondly, accumulating debt can be become a burden that influences relationships and personal health. I have known people who have suffered physically and in terms of their relationships because of excessive debt. Uh, a number of studies have been done in terms of marriages, and every study I've seen concludes the same thing. The number one reason why people uh, argue in their marriage is money. And they argue over how to spend it, how it should be spent. They argue over who should be controlling the money, who's got the checkbook. And they argue about debt. They argue about purchases and whether they're worthwhile or not because maybe one spouse feels that the purchase is going to put them in a position of debt that's excessive and the other person does not. And so, so debt can influence and destroy relationships, excessive debt, and it can destroy your health. I've known people who've who found themselves in such a hole in terms of debt and they worried so much and became so stressed that the next thing you know they've got high blood pressure and they've got stomach issues and other complications all because they found themselves uh, with excessive debt. Borrowing, number three, presumes the future and we don't know what tomorrow brings. James chapter four, we're, we're reminded, you know, we don't know what going to happen tomorrow. We, we tend to assume we have tomorrow. We might get ready for bed at night and say, well, you know, tomorrow I got that doctor's appointment at 10, then in the afternoon I got to go to the post office, and you don't know that you're going to wake up tomorrow. You don't know that you're going to be able to do those things. You'll only be able to do those things if God allows you to do those things. And so the Amish way of thinking is if you borrow and assume that you're going to have tomorrow and you're going to be able to go to work and make money to pay back that loan, then you're, you're presuming something that may not happen. And so for them, it's against their faith. It's unbiblical for them to, to go into excessive debt to borrow. And the fourth one I find really interesting, to pay someone on time, as they see it, is an extension of the commandment, do not steal. So if, if you owe a bill on the 10th of the month and you don't pay it till the 15th, in their minds, you've been stealing that money for five days. Because for those five days, they couldn't take that money and invest it. You've stolen their interest. Does that make sense? Until you pay it. So they see it as an extension of that commandment. Do not steal. Well... Some of you may find yourself already in excessive debt, and we can talk about uh, what can be done about that, but how do we avoid falling into the trap of debt? And excessive debt, again, is debt that is to embarrass us before God and before others. And speaking of that, you know, when ministers are ordained in the United Methodist Church, we're ordained at annual conference, we stand before the bishop and all the clergy and all the guests of the conference, and we're asked a handful of questions. And the questions go all the way back to John Wesley, who was the, 
the founder and leader of the, the Methodist movement. And one of the questions that were asked is, are you in debt so as to embarrass yourself? That's one of the questions we get asked before we can be ordained. And you know what? More and more ministers are having trouble answering that question. Because after four years of college and three years of seminary, a lot of ministers are coming out of school and they're in some serious debt. And so they have to wrestle with that question. Before borrowing, there's some questions that you and I can ask ourselves that might help guide us in this process. First question, have I counted the cost? You know, Jesus talked about, you know, if somebody's going to build a house, they stop and count the cost. We're doing that now in the church here as we think about building the Family Life Center. We're having conversations about, well, how much is that going to cost? What's the design going to look like? You know, how are we going to pay for it? That's, that's usually what you do before you step into that kind of venture, right? And so there may be a purchase that you're looking at. It may be something that you need or it may be something that you want. Are you ready to do that? Financially, can you afford to do that? Count the cost. Secondly, have you presented the need to God in prayer? You might think, well, you know, God doesn't care if I buy a big screen TV. Well, maybe he does. If it's going to put you in debt in such a way that it's going to influence your relationship with God and with others. I don't think there's anything too small that you can't bring before God. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on our head. For some of us, it doesn't take as long to count. <laughs> but the idea is there that God cares about the little things and the big things in your life. So before you make a, a purchase, you know, have you, have you given it up to prayer? And maybe if you give it up in prayer to God, you might come away saying, you know what, I don't know that I really need to do this. Because by taking the time to prayer, it slowed me down. We talked last week about delaying our gratification, you know. Just that slowing down enough to pray about it might cause us to say, you know, well, I'll, I'll sleep on it. Maybe I just need to think about that some more. Have you prayed about it? Next, God promises to meet my needs. Matthew 6, you know, Jesus said, wow, even the birds, you know, they get taken care of. God loves his creation. God meets my needs, but is this a need or a want? And that's where the line gets blurred. And it's interesting, I, I find when I listen to a lot of people, you know, I got to get this, you know, I need it. And then even with my kids sometimes I'll say, did you say you needed that? And then they just break into a smile. Well, you know, Dad, I, I, I want it. But we adults go the same route. We just got to have it. Is that really the case? And in the last sermon in this series, that's what I'm going to talk about. Wrestling with that difference between need and want. It's an important question uh, to be able to answer before making a significant purchase. And the last question is a good one. Um, is God being honored by my money decisions? Money is such a funny thing with us as people. As Christians, we're so good at separating money from everything else in the journey of faith. Oh, we'll pray. Oh, we'll read our Bible. Oh, we'll go to church. Now, when it comes to money, that's, that's like something else. But it's not for God. It's very important to God. Jesus, you know, the scripture said you can't serve God and money, right? Why did he go to the point of stating that so boldly? Because we struggle with that. We struggle with that. Why did Jesus tell that rich young ruler that wanted to follow him? Why did he tell him, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Because that was his God. And it was no way that rich young ruler was going to really follow Jesus until he got his other God out of the way. And sometimes in church, I have found that we might come to church with our church envelope or we're ready for the offering plate to come by. We put our offering in the plate and we say, okay, you know, I did my money thing in church. But you're not done as far as honoring God. Everything that you keep is still God's. Right? He gave you the strength and the resources to, to earn it. Everything comes from God. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So what you keep you want to use for God's purposes, you want to honor God with, right? Not just what you put in the plate. It's not just a token kind of thing, but everything. So what you buy, 
how you invest your money. It should all be lifted up to God. And we should be asking ourselves, do my relationships honor God? Is the way I use my time honor God? If I'm loafing at work, if you're, if you're at your desk at work in front of the computer and you're playing computer games when you're supposed to be doing your job, you know, is that honoring God? Same thing with money. Am I honoring God with what he's given me? He's given this to me and he wants me to use it well. Am I doing that? Am I controlling my money? Am I managing my money? Or is my money controlling me? Is my stuff managing me? Many years ago, there was a, a wealthy young man. He was a millionaire several times over. His name was Millard Fuller. Only 29. And he was loaded. <laughs> and because he had so much money, he had a lot of concerns about money. That was his life. Money and business. And he spent a lot of time doing that. And he got married. His wife's name was Linda. And, uh, you know, they were happy at the beginning. And he just was so tied into his stuff, you know, his money, that he neglected his wife. And she didn't feel love coming from him. She needed emotional intimacy. She needed to know that he was listening to her and that he cared for her. And, and he was kind of wrapped up in business. And so she told him, I'm leaving. And she did. She left and she took an apartment in New York City. And during her absence, Millard Fuller realized that his life was empty. That as great as it was having a bunch of money, not having his wife with him left a hole in his heart. So he went to her. He went to the apartment. And he pleaded with her. He said, I've realized since you've been gone what what I was doing and what I wasn't doing and I'm sorry and he poured out his heart and they stayed up most of the night talking just sitting there on the sofa and she poured out her heart and told him what she needed from him as a wife and this conversation changed their hearts right there in the apartment and they got on their knees right there at that sofa and they prayed and they surrendered everything that they had and everything they were to the Lord. And they decided that what they wanted to do with their resources was help other people. Because they kind of figured out that's why they were so blessed. That it wasn't really theirs, it was God's. And because they made that commitment, we have Habitat for Humanity. That's how it got started. You see, once we get the relationship right with God and with money, everything becomes a little bit clearer. But when it's fuzzy, things can get pretty messed up. So this morning, as I close in prayer, I want to pray for all of us about our relationship to stuff and our relationship with God. And if you find yourself in a position where you have excessive debt, I guess my closing advice to you would be don't be afraid to get help. Talk to somebody uh, who's good with money. There are organizations, Christian organizations, that can help you to manage your debt and help you with paying down credit cards and that sort of thing. Don't be afraid to reach out and get help. And if you need to talk to me, talk to me. And I'll, we'll, we'll try to connect you to a, a resource that can help you. Lord, thank you for everything that you've entrusted to us. We confess, Lord, that sometimes we're greedy. We want a lot. We see other things that other people have and, and we want them too and Lord we just get confused we sometimes we just take our eyes off of you and uh, we just focus on what you've made and we lose our focus on you so Lord forgive us for the times that we've done that help us going forward Lord to make wise decisions about making purchases about how we manage things and money Remind us that it all belongs to you. And Lord, if we're in, in such a hole in terms of debt, Lord, then would you just help us, Lord? Would you connect us to a resource that can help us, a person, an organization, and help us to be wise and faithful with all that you've entrusted to us? And as we do that, we pray that we'll just glorify you in the way that we live and spend our time, the way we spend our money, the way we 
share in relationships and with the church. All this we pray humbly in the name of Christ, the healer. Amen. One of the reasons that I like the United Methodist Hymnal is that it has such a divergency of hymns in it. And in being a Methodist and having John Wesley as the adopted father of Methodism, we often used to hear about preaching on sanctifying and perfecting grace, and especially on personal holiness our hymn this morning, Seek Ye First, The Kingdom of God, number 405, is sort of a perfect culmination of sanctifying perfect and perfecting grace and your personal holiness. Shall we stand in the glory of God and turn into our hymnals to hymn number 405, Seek Ye First. now, friends, take the words of this closing hymn with you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all the other stuff, all the things that you need, they'll come into focus and it'll be clear as you trust in Christ. For there's power in the name of Jesus, power to break the chains. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>